we're working together with uh, Dave and Judy in Sugar X Global. The first time we, we, we spoke, we, uh, we, we talked about your company, um, Piece of Keto, but now you're in Sugar X. Could you uh, tell something about Sugar X? What's that and what are you doing? Well, Sugar X Global is a worldwide community of addicts and our, I would say our primary thing that we offer is a place to enhance and increase your ongoing recovery. So we help people stop and stay stopped, you know, and then what do you do? So we like to say we help people get out of the food and into living and, you know, into living into the person they were meant to be and not having the obsessive compulsive thoughts about food, what I call a food mosquito buzzing around your head. What can I eat? When can I eat? How much can I eat? When can I have it? You know, oh my God, are you not going to eat that dessert? You know, like every thought is about food. Oh, what diet should I go on next? How much exercise do I have to do if I, if I want to eat this thing? Oh my God, I was so bad yesterday. I'm not going to eat it all today. Like, that's suffering, right? I mean, that's suffering. And, and to feel the guilt and shame because of the loss of control and all of that stuff. So we really believe that addiction is a disease and we treat it very seriously. So we're not into like the harmful users or sugar reduction. The goal at Sugar X is to get it out of our life. And so we can start having a life, you know, because when we're taking in that psychoactive substance, we're keeping that alive. It's eat, crave, eat, crave, eat, crave. And addicts eat because of the because of the, the drug, right? So we believe that sugar is a psychoactive substance and we can see that on MRI. So we treat it very seriously and we, we like to have fun doing it. So the circle community that we offer is, it's kind of, it's on a private platform. So it's not on social media, it's not on Facebook. And it is amazing. So we have people from all over the world and we have meetings, you know, at different times all week long. And we're adding more and more groups all the time. And we really focus on care, which is our motto. And care is connection because we believe connection is the best protection for an addict. Action steps because we don't think our way into recovery. We have to act our way into recovery. Recovery protection, which is what a lot of people call relapse prevention, but we think it's better off. Let's, you know what, if we kind of can see where we're going, then, you know, uh, and, and know what those warning signs are, we don't have to go back to the food. And then education. We believe people really need to be educated about their body, their mind, uh, all kinds of things. Like, you know, it's, it's proven that if you just take three breaths and you just breathe, you know, for three breaths and pay attention to those breaths, that you calm down your central nervous system. Mm. That's just a scientific fact of how our body and brain works. And so we want to equip people to be able to stay calm, keep calm, uh, and, and understand, you know, what are your triggers and your warning signs? Because if you can figure those out, you can protect your recovery. You can have a game plan. And we think it's really important to equip people to live in recovery because sugar addiction, as you know, is the hardest to, to quit because sugar and food is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. We're, we're going to have to go to the restaurant. We're going to have to go to the party. We're going to have to go to the grocery store. I'm a recovering addict. I don't have to go to the dope man's house. I don't have to go to the bar. Yeah. But food is everywhere and I have to eat. Yes. Yeah. And I really like the way you, you talk about the protection. I mean, to protect your own recovery. That's, that's a, I don't know, that, that kind of touches my heart more than talking about relapse prevention. This is like a, a protection. It's, it's, more, it's more caring in my ears, in my, it <laughs> in is. my heart. Yeah, it's, it it's meant to be. It's yeah. meant to be something that, um, that makes you feel like you're doing something positive. Yeah. It's not that you're looking for the negatives. It's you're looking for, you know, you're looking for your history because we can, we can do an autopsy of past use, right? Yeah. And we can see, oh, I used and I rationalized it this way or every time I went to this spot or when I visited my mom's, you know, and, mm. and she, she pushed this food on me and I felt like I was going to be a bad person. I, I just didn't know how to say no might have been the problem. So we can learn how to say no. And one of our villagers came up with a great thing that she says, you know, when, when someone was offering her some food over the holidays and she said, 
um, the, the person said, oh, don't you, don't you like my food? And she said, I love your food. I, I, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. And you are such a fabulous cook. I just can't eat that food anymore. And so wow. she said she loved her food. And then she said, I, but I don't eat that anymore. Yeah. That, that, that causes me harm, you know? And I thought, what a lovely, beautiful way. And so, so the thing about being in this huge village of people, right. And having meetings where you have people from all over the world, you're going to hear something different. Mm -hmm. And unlike like say a 12 step meeting or something like that, we can be specific and we can talk about a lot of stuff and I can coach people. And I'm a high performance coach and I'm also a primal health coach and a keto carnivore coach and uh, also, you know, of course, went through HMA with Bitten, and I'm on staff with her, helping her train the next generation, as well as sugar certified. And I feel like I have a very good understanding of addiction. And we do use the red dog and the blue dog, and we have all kinds of tools people can use and that we can offer and that we can workshop. And we do like things like breakout rooms and things like that to help people get connected. And so it's, you can hear something that might save you from a, from having that, you know, that moment where you remember, oh my gosh, I remember so-and-so said this loving way of saying no to someone. I could do that. I don't have to say, I can't eat that. Why are you trying to, you know, because we just don't know how to, you know, connect the dots. And so having this huge shared experience and like we have different meetings on different things. So this morning I talked about um, in our group, it was all about the recovery process. And we talked about all the stages of recovery and what each stage has in it. And then we talked about the benefits of recovery and also the cons of recovery, right? Because it's really hard to stay in your recovery, say when really lifey things happen, like, like uh, if a member, maybe they experience a sudden death of a close loved one or something like that, what are you going to do then? Mm. You know, it's harder to practice your recovery. But if you've put some of the recovery activities into place, like making that connection, and that's become a regular thing for you, then it's much easier to ride out that storm and protect your recovery. So yeah. we do a lot of teaching, 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 teach, don't preach is what Bitten says, and we believe that's very effective. It is, it truly is. And I think that the, the knowledge and the know-how and, and, can, and, put it in, and put it into action, and that's really, really important. And what I wanted to bring up today with, together with you was the addiction interaction disorder. I've been talking about it before, but what I really wanted to point out today is that uh, sugar addiction is an addiction for real. I meet people who uh, don't understand that this is really an addiction. They kind of like, it's like I said, I uh, we were talking before and I told you that I usually say that this is not a magazine sugar addiction that you can tick up the boxes and stay with sugar five days of seven or something this is a disease and it's an illness and you can die from it it's exactly. not it's nothing you just um call yourself no it's not a a name or something it's an illness and it is an illness for sure yeah and what i also see is that uh, I mean, if, if I if I go off sugar, if I'm not very uh, aware, I can start using something else. I can start drinking or I can start uh, shopping or um, whatever m makes pleasure, not pleasure, but but uh, takes a high. Marks. Yeah, it gives me a high rush or something or Internet or um, social media or whatever. So what are your thoughts on that when you when I say that sugar addiction is an addiction for real? <laughs> well, sugar addiction is an only addiction, isn't only a, an addiction, it's the first addiction. No one, no one is given a bunch of alcohol when they're a little kid. So sugar is the gateway drug. Mm -hmm. And sugar is psychoactive. And on it on MRI images, we can see. The, the low energy of the brain, right? The dopamine reward center becomes unresponsive, right? We, we become dopamine resistant, much like someone becomes insulin 
resistant. And that's why then it takes more and more. We have to use more and more, eat more and more to get the same effect because it's not working anymore. It's like the boy that cried wolf. The dopamine has been crying wolf, you know, knock, 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 I'm here. And the, and the rest of the cells are like, I can't have any more. You can't give me, you know, there, our body has homeostasis. And so when we hit that reward center repeatedly, 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 it stops working to protect us. Our brain is trying to protect us. In the meantime, we have this thing called euphoric recall. And most of us can't even remember the first time we got that, ah, uh, you know, that relief or that feeling from sugar. And I, I actually use a video. It's it's called Baby's First Taste of Ice Cream or something yeah, like oh, that. Yeah, that's awful. I, I, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so it's a video from YouTube to try to demonstrate to people how not responsible we are for an addiction. So people want it to be a moral dilemma and not a disease. They want it to be, why can't you just push yourself away from the table? And I'm talking about my own voice inside of my head, let alone what people are saying to you, right? So this diet industry has a 95% failure rate, right? Because not because you don't, because you, because there's something wrong with you. It's because the, there's something wrong with the diet, right? Yeah. We can't diet our way into overcoming this thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's really important to think of what is addiction, number one. So addiction is chronic. Well, it's primary. That means it doesn't have an underlying cause. That means that addiction just happens, right? And so there's some evidence that some of us have a very highly sensitive reward center to begin with. And I believe that's true. I believe that that means that in the cave days, my very special brain would have helped keep the tribe alive. I would have been the first one up in the morning saying, let's go get some berries. Let's go hunt. Let's go fish. Let's have sex and procreate so we can survive. So you take this hunter-gatherer brain and fast forward to where we live now. 24-7 yeah. access to anything you want, anytime you want it. Mm. Food, sugar, sex, drugs, alcohol, porn. It doesn't matter. Shopping. You, you don't stores used to close. They used to close. Now we've got Amazon 24 seven, yeah. you know? And so I like what Russell Brand says, we're no longer hunter gatherers, we're hunted and gathered. And so put us in this artificial stimulation, we're supposed to want to eat. Let's just get that clear. That's a part of our survival brain. And so when we taste something sweet in nature, that's never poisonous. And now you have this these hyper palatable sweets. And I'm talking about just like sugar and things like that, period. Even if they're not like put into a process, that sugar isn't something we would have had in nature. Sugar would have always been wrapped up in a package, mm -hmm. you know, a piece of fruit or some vegetable or something like that. It wouldn't have just been all by itself. And so now we, we have these highly processed things and that just makes us want to hunt and gather more, right? Mm -hmm because it's part of our survival instinct. And then we're like, oh my gosh, what's happening to me? I can't control myself and this and that. The change has probably happened. But when you see this baby have her first bite of ice cream, it's like. Yeah, it's, you can literally see it explode. The brain's kind of exploding. It's really, um, yeah. It's frightening. It's frightening. And so, you know, here in the United States, they now recommend for the first two years, absolutely no added sugars. Yeah. So you have the whole fact that it's a primary illness. In other words, it just happens to some of us. But I think it's happening to more and more of us because the substance is getting, we're getting earlier and chron more chronic exposure to the substance. Yeah. So yeah. processed foods are 70% of the American diet now. So just that exposure now, and we're talking about ultra processed foods like French fries and cookies and candy and yeah. pop and things like that. And so if that's 70% of what people are eating, guess what? Your brain is going to take a hit. And yeah. I think what people forget, Annika, is that the brain is an organ. Your heart's an organ. If you had a heart disease, you would, doc, what do I need to do? Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've got a brain disease and all of a sudden you're like, I should be able to control it. Right? So so this denial kicks in with addiction and it's unique to the disease of addiction. So addiction is, again, it's, it's primary and then it's chronic, which means it's not going away. Once you become a pickle, you can't go back to being a cucumber. Yeah. You can't be a little bit addicted. You can't be a little bit pregnant. So once you know you have an addiction, just like I have hazel eyes, 
I'm not going to, my eye color is not going to spontaneously change to some other color, right? So I have an addiction, just like I have curly gray hair, right? And, and then it's progressive. And that means with or without using the drug, I can get into those other outlets that you were talking about. Yeah. I can, I can become, I can have process addictions without even using a substance. So I could become a chronic helper or a people pleaser, which you, you spoke about that for us. Yeah. I could become a chronic uh, perfectionist. I could, you know, workaholic, I could shopaholic porn, you name it. So I could plug into some other outlet and it's also fatal. And, and I was telling Annika about this right before we got on, but a couple of years ago, one of my friends, she was 50 years old and she had diabetes and she was a recovering addict. And I knew her for years. She had a couple of decades clean from drugs and alcohol. And what killed her was her sugar addiction. She was sitting in a wheelchair the last time I saw her with an above the knee amputation of the right leg, drinking a big, big ass soda pop, like one of those like 64 ounce jugs, you know, sitting there with a cigarette hanging out of her mouth and a bag of Cheetos on her lap. And she died and she left kids at home and she knew what I do and who I am. And she didn't want help. So I, I quit asking because you know what? Uh, the work that we do, we recover alone, but we do it together. And no one can make an addict decide that they that it's time for them to change. And denial is so strong. It means don't even notice I am lying. Mm. Or sometimes we just don't even care because what am I going to do? How will I give up these things, right? And this is why these magazines get away with writing their little, well, you can have just a little, but just a little of a psychoactive substance. Can an alcoholic? Can they have a sip? No. Nope. Can a junkie just, you know, maybe shoot up on the weekends? Nope. <laughs> and so, you know, a sugar addict, there is no safe amount. That's what needs to be understood. There's a difference. So there is no safe amount. No, and I think that's really, really important to point that out to people because I, I um, like I said, I meet a lot of people who really think that sugar addiction is something kind of cute. They kind of, they come to me and I said, well, I might be a little sugar addict or uh, sugar addicted. And I'm like, like you said before, uh, if you compare addiction to being pregnant, you can't be a little pregnant. You are pregnant or you are not, but you can be like uh, you uh, in the first week or you can be in the uh, in the ninth, uh, ninth month kind of. Yes. So, of course, it, it looks differently uh, during the, the, the journey. But uh, if you have an addiction, you have an addiction. And that's a lethal um, uh, illness, really, to be very... Uh, um, aware of and to you need tools to recover and you need to do it together with with someone yes. really yeah when i think obsession and compulsion and isolation and alienation are really kind of the hallmarks of the disease of addiction so you're always thinking about the thing right when can i get more how much can i get when can i sneak away to eat more or do this or that you know you find yourself hiding your snacks you're doing things that you feel guilt and shame for yeah. right and i think also like when you try to stop you can't keep your word to yourself and then you tell yourself, I'm going to stop tomorrow or I'll stop next week. And that that line just keeps going further and further. And you and you start to feel such guilt and shame that you kind of you could be in a room full of people, but you're not really with them because you feel so ashamed and horrible about yourself. And you feel like, you know, I've had addicts do the sugar that, you know, they missed out on such important events mm -hmm. like they were supposed to be a bridesmaid and they didn't show up. They just didn't show up because they couldn't because their guilt and shame was so heavy. Yeah. You know, I've, I've dealt with addicts who were completely suicidal because of it. They wanted to hurt themselves because they couldn't live with this internal dialogue and this self-hatred that are really like later stages of addiction. Very real. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's also one thing that is important to to point out when we're talking about addiction interaction disorder. When you when you know when you learn about addiction, the knowledge that it, that you give or or teach in the uh, in the sugar X, how addiction really works and how recovery works, what it looks like, 
because I know that when I start to hide, lie, and sneak with stuff, I have to be aware. Is this a new outlet for me? Is this a new, when I don't, like I said before, if I don't eat sugar, well, the shopping, if, I, if I'm kind of, well, I, I don't want to tell my, my family that I bought this stuff, you know, then I know I have to be aware. Or if I'm doing the, the internet or looking, looking on uh, social media and when someone comes in, like I shut the phone and, and hide it away or I, I just pretend I didn't do it. I mean, there are so many signs I have to look for. And in that, in, if, if I do it like this and be honest uh, and share that with someone who is also in, re in recovery, I can stop my my uh, addiction from from taking another way or going into another outlet i think i'm i i mean i i have to live with this with this illness the rest of my life but when i know recovery i can stick to recovery and uh, yes. look for some signs and that's why it's also i mean the protection that we went, that we spoke about earlier to know the early signs to be able to to see them and to stop it before the, the bricks start falling further and further. I think that's very important. Absolutely. Forewarned is forearmed, you yeah. know, and that's why we work on, you know, developing what are your cues. So we use cue cards or cue sheets, and it's something that we came up with based on Gorski's, uh, you know, thoughts, feelings, urges, actions, reactions. And, but we wanted to simplify it because you take a foggy brained addict and they're like, what the, I can't do this. You know, this is too much work. So we do cues, customs and consequences. So we look, what's the cue? So the cue, like one of my cues would be like, when I sat down on the couch at the end of the night, well, I just ate whatever because it was my time and I deserved a treat and I'd been working hard all day and this and that. So my custom was to just pig out on the couch and binge watch TV. Yeah. And the consequence was I felt sick and I felt ashamed and <clears throat> powerless and out of control. And so now I can take the same cue. So sit on the couch. Now, what can I do instead? Right. So, so now the couch is a no food zone. That's not a reward. It really makes me feel bad. Did you notice those consequences, Anna? That you don't feel good when you do that. So that's just the truth. So mm -hmm. what can you do instead? <coughs> so I get myself a nice hot mug of tea. Yeah. And I sit down and I have a nice cup of tea and I enjoy every sip of it. And then as a result, my consequences are good consequences. I feel good and I didn't have to binge. Yeah, and that's how we do the brain bypass. <laughs> to start doing differently. But for doing that, we really need to understand what's happening and to see uh, the consequences, the bad ones, and share them with someone who can help us to, to make them positive ones instead. And for that, you really need honesty. I mean, to be honest, what it looks like, what it feels like, what happens, and so on. And to do that, you need a safe space safe space and I think you have it like in sugar eggs or or whatever community you choose to to go right to and you them. know I think the best time to identify cues is in early recovery yeah. and I think the best time to do it is like sometime in the afternoon when you've been awake for a little while yeah. instead of looking ahead take a look back were there some times during the day today that I felt triggered what was that cue and you just, you could even just collect a list of cues for a while. So you at least know, so you're forewarned. So 3 p.m. is a tough time for me, Anna, you know, help me. And then we can talk through that. You know, that's why having other people in your corner is really good. Yeah. And then Dave talks about the trigger-free triangle, which is something like what you were talking about, you know, those feelings that are involved with it and, and the lying and the cheating and the, and all of that kind of thing. And so he talks about, um, you know, guilt, uh, romance, and um, what's the other one? Debate, you know, yeah, so, yeah. so you might debate something like, should I eat this? Should I not? Well, you know, I've been all good week, all, all week I've been good and I haven't eaten anything on the couch. Maybe I should make an exception this time. Yeah. So that'd be an example of debate. No, no, don't do it. 
So if you hear yourself debating, that can be a cue as well. And then with the romance, it could be like, I'm just going to sneak up off the couch and tell my family that I'm just going to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. And then I'm just going to eat a little something in the kitchen. And then, so I'm having an affair with some food behind some people's back. That's being sneaky. I'm having a little affair with my, you know, I'm romancing my little food. And then with the guilt, is it, am I going to feel guilty if I do it? then no, don't eat it. So, so these kinds of things can really help you. And it's really difficult to learn new things because our brain doesn't want to change. We want to keep doing the 95% of what's been normal. So I, if you've already always brushed your teeth with your right hand, you're not all of a sudden, it's not going to be easy for you to all of a sudden brush your teeth with your left hand. So you're going to feel uncomfortable when you change. And I think that scares a lot of addicts. But if they could, if they could map out where do you want to be a year from now? Yeah. Who do you want to be? How do you want to feel about yourself? Do you want to be free from cravings? Then don't think about doing this for the rest of your life. Think about, I can struggle for just for today. I can do one more thing just today, just to make it to bedtime. And all those little things add up to great rewards, awesome rewards. Hmm. You know, you, you have to take another step. You have to just, you know, put one foot in front of another and, and take that next step and having the support of a community and having the right people in your corner, because there's a lot of people out there that want to treat harmful use and addiction at the same time. And that's too messy because for, for addicts, it's life or death. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's life or death. You know, it's we we go crazy. We become institutionalized. We become highly depressed. There are lot, lots of other diseases that are diagnosed sometimes before addiction. Maybe you were diagnosed with depression. Yeah. Maybe you felt suicidal and you didn't know why you were feeling so crazy. Well, these psychoactive substances are going to keep you feeling crazy. Uh, I had a lady share just the other night in one of my meetings that she doesn't have anxiety anymore now that the food is fixed. Mm. And that's great. And that's what I see also. You can really, uh, uh, you know, all the, it's kind of when you go into recovery, into recovery or, or treatment, you kind of come in there and you have a lot of different problems. You are, you're uh, high blood pressure or you're depressed or your uh, family isn't uh, acting the way you want to, or, you know, all these kinds of crazy stuff you, you enter treatment and then when you when you come out or as you start to recover you realize that my biggest problem is that I have an addiction and if I can work on recovery all the other stuff will probably get solved and especially when you deal with sugar addiction because when you change the diet there are so many other physical problems and mental problems that really solve or, or get better even if it doesn't disappear uh, entirely you have uh, a whole other uh, how should I describe it? To me, it feels like it's a, it's a, uh, another level of recovery. I don't know if if uh, if I'm wrong, but I I meet a lot of people and I I meet um, addicts who tells me that sugar addiction is the hardest addiction to recover from. Like you said in the in the in the beginning that. Um, you have it all over, um, all, all over, all, all uh, um, around you. And also you have to eat three times a day. For some people, that's a trigger even to eat. I mean, even if you have safe food and good food, that can also be a problem. Yes. It, yeah. But we've also been talking about um, uh, different outlets in sugar addiction. I mean, when I'm, I'm also a volume addict, I tend to eat a lot of food and I love it. <laughs> and I get the high from doing that. But that's because I have a sugar addiction to start with. The sugar, sugar is the gateway drug. I started with eating sugar and flour. And then my, uh, my brain, something happened to my brain. So I, it doesn't respond to me being full. So I have to eat more and more and more to get to get full, to feel full and, and, and satisfied. So for me, it's always like all, all the other addictions comes from sugar addiction, no matter what outlet you have. And that's I exactly that. right. Yeah. You know, I, I was raised in San Francisco and at nine years old, I was offered to smoke a joint Yeah, and that was it. I was off to the races. And at 17 years old, I got clean 
And then I, then I went back out again because I switched addictions from then from drugs back to sugar and a man. So now I had a relationship addiction too. Yeah. And so then I, you know, so then I got clean again at 23 and literally I've been clean from drugs and alcohol ever since then. But one of the things that I did with a few other women that got clean at the same time as me, we went out once a week and we would have these huge hot fudge sundays. And I mean, we put everything on them, but mine were bigger and, you know, more like messy than everybody else's. I'd get every candy on there, every flavor of syrup you could get, you know, three scoops of ice cream. And I probably would have eaten more if I wouldn't have been embarrassed to, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so the only, only thing was stopping me was my false ego, right? And so I, uh, you know, we called these sex fudge Sundays because we were abstaining from, we weren't doing drugs. We weren't doing alcohol. We weren't having sex with men. So we deserved to eat this crap, right? Mm -hmm. When I had been clean between 17 and like around 20, uh, <clears throat> when I got pregnant with my son and I was 18 years old and I wasn't using, I wanted a hit so bad. I needed some relief, mm. you know? Because I didn't know, see, the thing is, like, we don't know how to live because this part of our brain has hijacked our ability to make good decisions and even know how to make good decisions and make good choices. And so my life was shit. I'm living with this guy who's back to banging dope. I mean, he's shooting up drugs, yeah. you know, and uh, I'm 18 years old. He's 13 years older than me and I'm pregnant. <laughs> and I went in my cabinets and I looked and I had a bag of powdered sugar and I mixed it with water and I ate it out of the plastic bag and I turned the bag inside out and I licked the bag. And I felt so ashamed and I knew what I was doing was harmful to my baby. I knew it was even at that young age, but I couldn't stop myself. And I promise you, if there had been two or three more bags, I would have eaten them all yeah. because the problem with addiction is more different, better. And that's what you were describing. And so when you want to, I just, I have an itch, I got to scratch it, yeah. you know, and the thing is don't scratch it, let the itch pass. And that's a hard thing to learn. That's a very hard thing to learn in recovery to just be still. And, you know, I, I really practice a lot of, um, I call it like um, kind of red dog interruption, right? Like that thought comes, I have to interrupt, destruction interruption is what I really call it. Yeah. So I want to put my finger on that detonator switch. I want to eat that thing. I want to shop. I want to cuss out one of my kids, whatever it is, right? I want to put my finger on that detonator switch. I want to destroy everything. I don't care anymore. And my addict is coming out, you know? Yeah. And if I just put on like a little Casey in the Sunshine band, do a little dance, <laughs> make a little love, you know, and, and dance around for a minute, I can interrupt that train of thought. Mm -hmm. I can take those three breaths that we talked about earlier and calm myself down. Oh, I can powerful. do something about it, but, but I got to be forewarned so I can be forearmed. And one of the ways I arm myself is I got a playlist of funny songs on, on Spotify. I have a playlist of disco, you know, whatever. So I can just hit a button and listen to something. And it's really hard when you're listening to like a favorite song from when you were a teenager yeah. to still think about the thing right yeah, yeah. so instead of taking that thought hostage because we well, that's what we do as addicts and we feel like it's an emergency right but here's the deal it's normal for an addict to want to use yeah we're an addict yes. we want to use yeah and so if, if i can accept that and if i can understand this just because i want to doesn't mean i have to then I can come up with that. I can pause and I can come up with that plan. Well, what am I going to do? And guess what? I get a little dopamine hit, just a little nice little drip, the kind I'm supposed to have from the enjoyment from dancing around my kitchen, yeah. goofing off to some music that I love, right? And I even close meetings on Circle with that. I close meetings with positive, uplifting music. A lot of my people will turn on their, you know, turn on their video and they'll chair dance right along with me. This morning we did, uh, it's a, we did Lovely Day by Bill Withers. And so everybody was, you know, they left the meeting and with a nice positive attitude. And we talked about some deep stuff. Yeah. But I don't want someone leaving a meeting and being morose. I mean, 
recovery should, should help you to be a full human that can experience all emotions. Yeah. We're not bad people trying to get good. We're, we're sick people trying to get well, Yeah, you know, and that's a quote from some literature that I love. And that's just the truth. Right. Yeah. And if we can, if, you know, if we would, would we begrudge someone getting help for their cancer? Do we take, you know, do we take children away from someone who gets diagnosed with cancer? No, but we do it to addicts all the time. You can't have your kids. Why don't we treat them as a whole unit? Because it's a family disease. Yeah. What if we put men and women in treatment together with their children, yeah. you know, for addiction? And when sugar is the gateway drug, you can really see how we're getting earlier and earlier drug addiction happening yeah. because we're getting earlier and more chronic exposure to the crap foods. And Dr. Lustig, who is a pediatric endocrinologist who wrote the book Metabolical, calls alcohol the or, or sugar the alcohol of the child. Yeah. So yeah. I don't care what people say or what they think. They just want to poo-poo it, you know, and oh yeah, yeah, sugar's not that big of a deal. It is. It's a huge big deal. It changes everything. We have kids with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That wasn't even a diagnosis until the 1990s. Yeah. So it's directly related to the amount of fructose in our in our processed foods. Yeah. And so. it's, it's serious. It's really serious. And I wish people could, could understand that. I, I think we could talk for hours. I really enjoy talking to you. And maybe we could do another video to go further and talk about, um, I mean, there's so much to, to uh, explore and to talk about and discuss and to, to show or to explain or, or uh, make people aware of. So I would love to, to do another video on that would be great. that topic. Yeah. <laughs> So I think we have to close it for now. So thank you so much for having this conversation with me and for sharing your story. It was really touching. And uh, I'm grateful for your, your, um, for your being here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I just want to say, you know what, if I can recover, anyone can recover. So don't give up. So we'll close with that. Thank you so much, Anna. <laughs>